the man, the senior producer uh. from NFL Films, also on the ESPN NFL matchup show every weekend during the football season. It is one Greg Cosell joining us here on One Bills Live. Greg, how you doing, sir? We've got one game left to play. I know, and no game this weekend. Uh, I'm, I bet Mr. Tasker doesn't mind that there's not going to be a game this weekend. <laughs> I got plans for the weekend. So <laughs> free time. I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something out crazy. I'm going to dress in my pajamas and watch TV all weekend. Oh, wow. There Look you go. <laughs> Way to rip it up, Steve. I got, you know, we Brownie and I were just saying, Greg, because we've been, you know, we've been, you know, neck deep in the Bills all season and to watch them come out and, and play against that Chiefs team this last week. And today is really kind of the first day where we can, you know, get our, our heads up, stretch out and say, you know what? It was a great season. It was a lot of fun. And even though they yeah. got beat by the Chiefs team this last weekend, there's a lot to build on here in Buffalo. But man, oh man, they met a buzzsaw in Arrowhead Stadium last week. What did you see? You know, it was kind of an interesting game. And, and let's start just with a macro worldview, because I kept trying to think, OK, if you're if you're a Bills fan, how do you see what happened and where they go? I mean, obviously, I think before the season, if you told Bills fans you'd be in the AFC championship game, they go, wow, that that's pretty cool. But then when the season happens and you get there, you obviously want to win. Um so the Chiefs look like the, the team that has to be beaten in the AFC. Wouldn't you say that's fair based on the last number of years? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the Chiefs score a lot of points. So if you have to beat the Chiefs, it, it would strike me that you're going to have to score points. So I think a lot of people might say, well, gee, the Bills need to run the ball better. And right now I'm just kind of talking philosophy here. You know, there's many ways to do this. A lot of people might say, well, gee, they need a better run game. Well, is the run game the way you're going to score more points? And I'm just posing that as a question. There, As I said, there's many ways, Steve, you know this, many ways to, to play, many ways to win games. But when all said and done, if you figure that Buffalo is going to be good for the next number of years because they've got a really good quarterback, uh, but they're going to have to play the Chiefs. And I think these two teams, don't they play in the regular season again next year? Yes, yes they do. in Kansas City. In Kansas yeah. City. Yeah, so I mean – the likelihood is you're going to have to score a lot of points. So the question becomes, yes, you want to build a really solid team. You want to be good in every area. But when push comes to shove, if you want to get to the Super Bowl, you're going to have to probably be able in a big game against the Chiefs to put up 35, 38, 40 points. So what's the best way to go about doing that? And I don't know if there's just a simple answer to that. You know, obviously people say, well, we got to throw the ball. Well, yeah, obviously – Passing tends to produce more explosive plays than running. But at the end of the day, what is the way you really go about doing that as an organization? Yeah, because one of the things is taken off the off the table. It seems to me with the current level of talent they've got on their offensive side of the ball, all the way down to Sammy Watkins and Mecole Hardman. Forget about the top two guys in Hill right. and Kelsey. You go all the way down to Sammy Watkins, third overall pick in the draft. He's got this physical skill set that says that's what he should be. Miko Hardman is faster than Sammy. You got uh, Clyde edwards Lair. They almost seem indefensible, plus the fact they got the, you know this unicorn who's throwing the football to them, right? So yeah, you you know old logic, old school logic says, well, you just got to you know defend them better, you know, keep them off the scoreboard so you can score. And that really is like, yeah, okay, but that ain't gonna work. And, and what does defending them better mean? That's a great question, yeah. Steve. Is defending them better mean you're going to hold them to 27 or 30? You're not going to hold them to 13 or 17. Uh, so at the end of the day, if you're if you're the Bills, you know, and you look at this off season, do you think in terms of hey, we even need more wide receivers and more speed on the perimeter because when all said and done, that's the way we're going to have to beat the Chiefs. We're not going to beat the Chiefs in a 17-13 game. So. That's why it's a difficult question because you look at your whole team. If you just look at your team in a vacuum, separate from, let's say, the Chiefs or other teams, you might say, hey, we need a great edge pass rusher. We need to run the football. We need this. We need that. But at the end of the day, to beat the Chiefs, you're going to have to score 35 or 38. Right. Yeah. And, you know, getting, getting around to that portion of the conversation, Greg, you know, Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean both had their season wrap up press conferences up here earlier in the week. And both of them said, we have to run the ball better. They didn't say they had to run it more. They said they had right. to run it better. 
And, and I think there's an important distinction there. And if you look, and I know Mike Tanier from uh, the ProFootballNetwork.com did a nice breakdown of the Bills this season with respect to the run game. And both Zach Moss and Devin Singletary were ranked high in broken tackle percentage, and they ranked high in yards after initial contact, co- contact across the league. So he took a deeper dive and found that on first down, the Bills didn't run the ball very well. They only averaged about 3.8 per carry, which is why Brian Dable moved away from that. And the Bills right. were, I think the Bills threw on first down either the most in the league or second most in the league all season long. So it begs the question, does the run game improve through schematic changes, uh, line changes, or both? Because he did uncover that the Bills on first down ran a lot of outside runs, pitch plays, and outside zone. Yes. And when you have safeties 20 yards off the line of scrimmage, when you run outside, you allow those deep safeties to flow to the ball, where if you just ran it up the middle, that opportunity doesn't exist for safeties that far from the line of scrimmage. And that's where the self-scouting, Chris, and the self-evaluation comes into play because every team, and you guys know this, every coach looks at uh, their particular unit three, four times, every play for the season. That's the first thing they do before they get into free agency in the draft is you self-scout and self-evaluate. So you have to decide if based on your the, those numbers, which are that's those are mathematical numbers, they're not wrong, you have to decide why that's the case. And it's easy to make a generalization. Oh, play, safeties are deep, so-and-so. You don't know that. We don't know that. And I can't remember every play, obviously. You have to see, hey, is that really the reason? Uh, are, are we? Did we not run well outside be, because we allowed safeties to get involved? Did we not run well outside because we didn't block well up front? There, there's, there's many different reasons, and you have to decide – sort of prioritize them. What's the reason it really didn't work? And then go, here's reason one, here's reason two, here's reason three. Um, But at the end of the day, do you have to run it better? Yes. And you made a great point. That doesn't mean you run it more necessarily, because running it more is not likely to produce more points. Right. It just means it'll be easier to throw it. (laughs) Well, maybe, (laughs) maybe not. I mean, uh, yeah, you got to, when it does, it it changes. It changes that's the way one the of those things that we've you. talked about for years. It's always right. been accepted as gospel that running the ball helps your passing game. And I'm not going to say it doesn't, but I, I don't think that's an automatic statement, Steve. I don't think that that's no. absolutely true. Well, right. what it does do is when you run the ball well, it changes the way the defense has to play you. And that changes the way you can attack it, right? I mean, that's, that's basically well, what it is. It changes the defense in front of you, which always – changes your ability to attack it in other ways. I I think the point is this, to me anyway, from just watching tape of every team, is I think when you line up with specific personnel and specific formations, you pretty much know what you're going to get defensively. That's what coaches do. That's why they work so many hours. Very, There's very few times where you're confused or you, or you see something you never saw. I remember this summer having a great conversation with Carson Palmer, and I asked him, hey, were you confused? Did you see things you, you'd never seen? He said, if that happened once every five, six weeks, that was a lot. So it's not that you're getting something new. What you're trying to do is create a situation where the defense is predictable based on your personnel and your formation. And then you know by what you do that you can put a particular defender in conflict. Let's say a player has both a run and a pass responsibility. You can put that player in conflict based on what you do. Right. I know that, uh, and I don't want to really rehash too much of the AFC title game, Greg, but I know last week when we were looking to that game, we were talking about the propensity for the Chiefs defense to play dime. I mean, they played at the third most percentage of snaps of any team in the league through the course of the season. I think I saw a number this week that Spagnolo had it on 75% of their defensive snaps in the game on Sunday. Um, I don't know if that's accurate. That's a number that I saw. Well, I can tell you for a fact, they played 54 snaps of dime and 16 snaps of nickel. Yeah. They did not play base. Right. So, and, and they executed it very well, but it was almost as if they said, well, we know this team is going to be passing, and if they can prove they can run effectively against the light box, well, then we'll adjust. 
But the Bills never did that, obviously, and, and they never had to kind of come out of that all that often, um, except in extreme down and distance situations or a time in the game or red zone or two minute. Um, what did you make of their dime package and why it looked that might have been their best defensive performance of the season uh, that the Chiefs had on Sunday? Well, Spags has been very, very aggressive all year. And and again, my sense is he's aggressive because he knows that his offense is going to put up a lot of points. So I think he knows, quite honestly, guys, that, hey, if they happen to hit a big one against my aggressive defense, so what? My guy's going to put up 30-plus, so if they hit one or two, hey, that's okay. But he's been aggressive all season. His profile this season out of sub, especially dime, has been man coverage with pressure. They'll play some snaps of cover two. Um, they'll, and when they play cover two, Matthew is the, the middle hole defender. Uh, they also have this kind of quarters match coverage, which they play all year. It's a spags thing where they actually rush five, and it looks like they're playing quarters uh, to the naked eye, but it's kind of a match concept. So they don't call it quarters. So those are the three defenses they really play at a dime the most. They play man, and they'll go zero in man. I mean, they played, a, a, I think, uh, in fact, I have the numbers. They played a number of snaps of zero in this game, um, 10 snaps of zero in this game, and that's yeah. a high percentage. But they played zero more than any team in the league. So uh, they, they play man with zero, they play cover two, and they play kind of that quarters match. Those are the three coverages that they predominantly play out of dime. And tell me if you saw this, Greg, because J Josh referenced this in his postgame comments. He said that there were times where they were late to show. And yeah. what that did was it, it prevented him from having enough time on the play clock to get back into their original play after he changed it based on the Chiefs' initial look. And he's right. There were a couple of times where they caught him. And, and, and again, I don't want people to take this the wrong way. It's not that Josh didn't know. It's you, you get caught sometimes. You know, the first I, I made a note of this. The first play of the Bills' fifth possession, the Chiefs were able to win, in a sense, before the snap because they showed a, a single high man coverage concept. You could see that Allen changed the play at the line to a vertical route, because that's what he saw. Um, it was a vertical route by Brown outside the numbers. And then they rotated to cover two, and they took Brown away. And Allen got kind of caught, focused on Brown. And you might remember the play. It should have been intercepted by Ward. You probably remember right. that play. Right. Um, but, yeah, they, they're they really good at disguise and late movement. And they do that to everybody. That's not just a Josh Allen thing. They do that to everybody, and they're very, very good at it. One of the things about that's coming now that we're starting to focus in the coming months, ton of quarterbacks are going to start moving around. Oh yeah, uh, uh, Matt Stafford. It seems like he's going to leave Detroit. Um, Deshaun Watson has asked for a trade from Houston, but it's coming out now. Houston has said we ain't trading him. Uh, how that ends in Houston is still remains to be seen. Uh, ben Roethlisberger is said he wants to play again, and the Steelers want him, but not at his price. Uh, how that ends up, uh, and I'm. Aaron Rodgers, I don't care what anybody says, Aaron Rodgers is not going anywhere out of Green Bay, no matter what he said. So, but, but still, uh, there's some movement that's going to happen at the quarterback spot, and uh, w what are some of your impressions about some of these guys that may move or may not? Yeah, well, it looks like Stafford is going to move because they, they kind of mutually agreed on that, so he's right. going to move. So I guess my question is, and, and obviously um, there's this sense – that Trevor Lawrence is a great player. He has not taken a snap in the NFL, and obviously he's got a lot of traits and looks like he'll be a really good player, but he's not played a snap in the NFL. So if you're a team that, you know, is is in a position to draft a quarterback with a relatively high pick, let's leave Jacksonville out of the mix for a moment. But if you're a team in a position to to draft a quarterback relatively high, What's your thought process? Are you taking a player that's never played in the NFL and that has some questions, or are you taking a player who's played at a high level in the NFL for years and it appears that he'll play at least four or five more years um, and giving up your number one pick? I mean, that's really the question you have to ask. We know that teams hoard their draft picks, but are you taking Justin Fields in the first round, a player, and, I, and I've already done Justin Fields in terms of evaluation, and he's got some, some definite concerns. Are you taking Justin Fields and saying, okay, we're going to take Fields. We'd rather have him than Matthew Stafford. 
I think you have to make that decision as an organization. I would probably want to get Matthew Stafford, but uh, I don't think I'm going to be called by the organization to I, uh, for my I'm opinion. With you. I'm with you. I it's a no brainer for me. It's you, you take the guy. I agree. He play, I agree. He can play. Yeah, the known commodity, right? Yeah. What about uh? You know, we've heard a bunch of teams being mentioned as as interested in you know quarterback suitors, if you will, for lack of a better term. A team like San Francisco is is particularly interesting, Greg, only because. You know, it seems like I don't want to say they're they're disenchanted with Jimmy Garoppolo, but it's clear that they're one of the teams that have been calling about Matthew Stafford. How would Stafford fit there in, in a Shanahan offense? Well, to me, and and I really looked, I've looked at Stafford his whole career, but I looked at him hard this past summer because I was home, and I think Stafford's a really, really good player. And my guess is, if you talk to people in the league people who watch tape and study and game plan, they would tell you he's a really good player. Uh, so I think he fits any system. I don't think he's, I think he's, he's in a sense scheme transcendent. I think he could play effectively in any system. You don't need one particular system for him. So I think he would fit fine in Kyle Shanahan's system. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that, you know, if they had to give up their number one or they, Again, I don't know how all that works. You know, I'm not, I'm not one who does those draft cards or draft boards, but I would give up a number one for Matthew Stafford. I would not see a problem with that. Yeah, I, I, I got to agree with you as well. And and uh, and, and I, it's interesting to me, and I agree with you. I saw it back in the day when he first came out. The Bills were still playing the Lions every year in the preseason, if not in the regular season, and you'd get a chance to see him play just a series or two. And he was he was special. Uh, he's oh. special early, and he's you know obviously he's been you know lived in Detroit for for ten years now, and he's he's taken a pounding, but I still think he's got a lot of good football in him and could be the fran face of a franchise for like you say four or five years and give you I a agree. deep I, run. Look, I know playoffs. I know what people do, and that's okay. They look at the fact that he's not won a playoff game, that he's not been in a Super Bowl, obviously, and they think that he's the reason that that hasn't happened. But if you talk to people who know and study. Um, Matthew Stafford is, is really highly regarded. He's a supreme talent. He throws the ball exceptionally well. He's got movement ability. He's tough as nails. We've seen him over the years, how competitive he is. Um, I think he's a really good player, and I think that would be echoed by a lot of people in the NFL. With respect to the, to the Eagles, Greg, um, obviously we just heard uh, in the sports update, Nick Sirianni introduced as the new head coach there formally today, and he's yeah. not naming any starters. He's saying, I got two really good quarterbacks, you know, in Carson Wentz and Jalen Hurts. Knowing Nick Sirianni's coaching tree is, is what he's bringing to the Eagles in terms of offensive schematics. Do, do you think it fits Carson Wentz's skill set better or Jalen Hurts' skill set better? Well, I would answer it this way, Chris. I was intrigued by who they hired as their quarterback coach. Brian Johnson, who's been with Dan Mullen for, uh, I think, in two stops. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very curious with that hire as quarterback coach, if that's, and again, I have no inside information. I'm just trying to read the tea leaves here and haven't spoken to anybody. But given that particular quarterback coach and the fact they brought in Shane Steichen from, uh, as the OC from yep. who was with the Chargers, yep. with Justin Herbert, I, I'm I'm just wondering if they see Hertz more as their guy. And we won't know the answer to that, um, you know, for quite a while. And obviously Nick did the right thing. You don't say who your quarterback is now. There's no reason for that. But I, they brought in a very young coaching staff uh, with theoretically young ideas. So I'm very curious to see how that plays out. Yeah, I, and, and one of the other guys that we've watched and who has said he wants to return to the team he finished with this last season is Ben Roethlisberger. Yeah. Now that Steelers said, we, we'll do it, but you're not going to be worth $42 million you're going to get. Uh. Uh, you know, so if they can work a thing out in Pittsburgh, as as much as they struggled, well, they were 11-0 at one point this season. I mean, it's not like the, you know, they had nothing going for them, but – yeah, it wasn't all that good there in the last six weeks of the season for him. What, what do you see in Ben Roethlisberger, what he has to offer, and how much football does he have left in him from your eye in watching the film? And it's a great question because they're in the same situation, at, in a sense, as, as Buffalo, is they're going to have to beat the Chiefs and score points. And 
throughout almost all of this season, it was everything was a quick passing game. They didn't really throw the ball down the field. They just did once in a great while. They did not really have an intermediate to intermediate vertical passing game. Um, I don't know if, if Roethlisberger can still do that or not. I don't know if they played the way they did. I don't know the reason they played the way they did, but that's the way they chose to play. So, you know, only they could tell you that, but I, I don't think Roethlisberger is the same guy he was, and I think they have to decide if he's back, and it looks like he will be, because um, if you don't have him back, you got to line someone up. So if he's back, is their offense going to look the same? And if you're going to play offense mm-hmm. that way, then you're not really producing a lot of big plays unless you get run after catch. So we'll see, because they couldn't run the ball very effectively at all. They had a stretch early in the season where they did, and then they really lost their running game. They had no running game. But I think they need a little more in their pass game from an intermediate to vertical, uh, an intermediate and vertical element. All right, Greg, we are out of time. But uh, thanks for giving us some insight this week. We appreciate it as always. It's been a, it's been a treat uh, going through this Bills season with you with your weekly visits. Thanks for uh, helping us dice up the tape every week. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks so much. 